Good evening and welcome to the March 1st, 2023 meeting of the Northboro Appropriations Committee. Uh, it's after the hour of seven o'clock and we are now in session. Um, the first item on our agenda tonight is the approval of minutes from February 22nd, 2023. We are actually gonna pass over those. Those minutes have not been completed yet. Um, next on our agenda, <coughs> excuse me, is review of Community Preservation Committee project request. We have Jeff Leland here uh, representing the uh, Community Preservation Committee. I'll uh, walk you through. Uh, and in your packet, you have a summary of the projects that are coming before uh, town meeting. Uh, there is a financial report, and then there is a, a historic uh, pie chart that shows how all the money has been spent over the years uh, to date. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Leland to walk you through that. Yes. So um, uh, one item on here, the first parish church steeple repairs. Um, I'm, I'm a member of that church, so I have to leave if it's being discussed. Um, yeah, it's uh, not being uh, funded, so you're not gonna be, it's not really before you tonight. It's just included in here. Uh, uh, that project isn't coming forward, Tony, so. Uh, okay. It's just included here as a FYI that it's one of the projects they received. As long as uh, we're not talking about it, then. We're not gonna be, okay. it's not before you tonight. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of your uh, committee. My name's Jeff Leland. I am on the Community Preservation Committee. Um, as John said, uh, you have some materials in front of you. What I'm gonna focus on um, is first the summary that our uh, chair, John Campbell, prepared uh, initially, it was stated February 14th, 2023, for the, appro for the uh, financial um, planning committee. And the first paragraph is the most important where the criteria that we use in making our decisions on an annual basis to present at town meeting. The first is the applicability to the CPA guidelines. The second is how much community support there has been for the project, either that year or in prior years. The affordability taking into account how much money that we have, and then also the urgency to fund in that year, which is a, a big factor for some of these projects. Um, taking that into consideration this year, is projected to have $770,000 in new money, and we also have some re reserve revenue uh, that we used. So I'll go line by line to each of these projects and briefly summarize them and then if anyone has any questions either at the beginning or the end please uh, i'll do my best to answer them so the first one is been in place since the property was purchased the white cliffs bond payment if you look at the accountant summary there is on i think it's page seven the last page it shows the debt service for the white cliffs project we're in year six and it's 188,000 to pay the bond this is one of the primary um, annual uh, projects that we as a CPC looks at and continues to fund since it was purchased initially and that shows you that what's been paid and what is projected for the coming years the committee uh, voted seven to zero to fund this with new revenue it also goes towards 10 percent which is a requirement under the act for historic preservation the second project is the administrative expense where we can put it aside up to five percent which we do typically and that those funds are sometimes used for unforeseen um, ish, uh, matters that come up like some feasibility studies that were done actually on the white cliffs over the last few years but also other reasons appraisals on uh, oftentimes if it's open space it, the funding will be used to conduct a, an appraisal to negotiate you know purchase so we've traditionally put aside that 5% and then it's either goes into uh, the unreserved accounts or reserved accounts or it is utilized during the year. The third project is for affordable housing reserve fund. Um, that's a mandatory 10% as well. So from new uh, revenue, we set that aside. Um, the fourth is the Northboro Dog Park. Phase one was uh, for the feasibility and this and planning was supported last year and this year we continue that with a phase two which will be 
the complete construction um, with this amount of 347.5. That would be considered a top priority. And that also uh, is from new, um, new revenue and um, goes towards our 10% requirement for open space and recreation on an annual basis. If I could just uh, interrupt John, you for please. a moment through the chair. Uh, again, the committee received a full presentation of the park from the uh, DPW director. I just want to be clear. So this is the funding coming from the CPC, 347500 uh, We received a $25,000 grant from the Stanton Foundation to complete the design so we can, in construction documents so that we can then move into construction. So this funding from the CPC is for construction. Uh, it is not the complete uh, budget. Uh, we are anticipating that once the design is completed, uh, we'll submit for a $225,000 Stanton grant. So that roughly 200 or 225,000 plus the 347 is the total cost of that dog park. So this is essentially the town's share coming out of the community preservation uh, fund. So, and that will, if it passes, that will uh, complete about an 18-year project that the town has been working on, little by little, gaining support. The next is uh, another: uh, the construction of the ADA accessible trail at the senior center. Um, this is also a phase two that was strongly supported last year, and this will pay for the construction. There are, I believe, grants being applied for that as well. And this will be a really, I think, the only ADA compliant trail that we'll have in town. Um, and that will come uh, 119000 from new revenue and 251000 from unreserved uh, funds that we have. The sixth one, which was mentioned beforehand, is the First Parish Church steeple repairs. The committee vote, voted not to um, fund that this year. We've supported the church in the past and may again in the future, but it seemed like the scope of the work and some of the cost estimates were not quite ready for this year. And with the other big projects that we had in the second and third phases, we decided that to pass over that one. The same is with the window restoration for the Historical Society building. We have supported them in the past, including with some shutters, historical shutters over the last couple of years. This did not seem to have the same urgency, and the estimated costs weren't quite laid out. So that's another project that the CPC will continue to look at in the future. The funding of the historic reserves, this uh, came after a lot of discussion through, uh, from people from the Historic Commission as well as the chair, and agreed to um, not allocate funds for this knowing that we were going to have some unrestricted funds that we wanted to keep ready for future projects like the White Cliffs or other ones that may come up. Um, the number nine is the Library Historic Marker. We've supported several of these in the past and um, our only split vote, but we still supported this because it was a reasonable amount uh, for a good project. Number 10 is the Aqueduct Multi-Use Trail Feasibility Study. And this was withdrawn based on some correspondence from the MWRA, and they're not ready to uh, push forward this project at this time. So that was withdrawn. 11 was the uh, high school athletic complex project. And like um, some of the other ones we m mentioned beforehand, while there's a lot of support individually from members of the committee, we felt that it wasn't as urgent for the uh, for the um, CPC this year based on the other major projects we're in multi-phases and second and third phases. Um, and then the next one is the conservation fund of 77,000. And that one, again, we didn't support, we didn't uh, vote for that for the same reason, feeling that we have some funds already, at, or rather the conservation fund already has about 664,000 in their reserve um, in case they have project to come forward. So the, just to wrap up my comments, the ending balance after our recommendations would uh, use up all of the projected new revenue and some of our reserve, but we're keeping 591,653 in the unreserved account um, or funds for either 
uh, projects like the White Cliffs or the downtown revitalization. We want to keep a little bit of our powder dry for what may come up next year and the year after. And um, affordable housing also has reserves already of nearly 280,000 plus some other funds. So there is funding available should uh, affordable housing at either the White Cliffs project or um, another project come forward. There are funds available to, to help fund that right away. And that's my basic summary. I'd do my best to answer any questions. Just to the chair, just for clarification, if I may. So unlike you're used to seeing like the capital improvement plan where we have six years of projects, they move up each year, and then the current year is what's going to town meeting for funding. Uh, the CPC is a little bit different process. It's whatever projects get submitted every year, they decide what they're going to fund, what they can fund, and what they decide to fund. So it's, it could be a little bit uh, confusing in terms of the way the memo uh, is structured. But if you look on the first page, uh, the first five projects are going forward to town meeting. And then on the second page, the library historic marker project is also going to town meeting. So there's 12 projects on the sheet in total. Six are on the town meeting warrant, which we'll discuss later, but those are the ones that uh, Jeff focused on. So those six projects are the ones that are really before you. The rest is just included, just so you know, well, what didn't get funded and, and why? Because oftentimes during that process, we try to keep the committee informed of uh, requests or applications. You might have heard that there was an application for the athletic complex, um, but this way it kind of closes that communication loop so you know it wasn't, it wasn't funded through the CPC. But six projects, the ones that are on the warrant, those are the ones that are moving forward. And just for viewers at home, for clarification as well, um, the CPC is a surcharge on your taxes at 1%. It's baked into your tax bill every year. The state then matches it to some varying degree each year, uh, depending on what they have for uh, revenues. Um, but essentially, all of these projects, or any of the CPC projects for that matter, that get funded, uh, don't result in any additional tax impact. There is tax impact, but you're automatically charged that 1% uh, of each year, and that's, in, it's, that's basically baked into your tax bill. So whether or not these projects get approved or not has no impact on your on, on the folks' taxes. I just think that's a distinction that they should know. They're clearly paying for them, but it's, it's kind of similar to some towns would do a surcharge on your taxes for, for capital projects, for roadway maintenance or something like that. So whether or not we do five roads or one road or your road or her road is irrelevant, sort of baked into your tax bill already. That's how the CPC uh, the Community Preservation Act works. Okay. Oh, but I didn't confuse the issue anymore, but uh, I hope that clarifies things a little bit. No, it's very helpful because that was going to be my first question to ask you to explain what new revenue was and how that was generated. So <clears throat> that was very, very helpful. And it's also helpful to hear explain how the 1% works because that does make sense because in some years we may have more projects than other years, so at least at 1%. It's it evens it out every year so that people aren't seeing their tax bills go up and down depending on projects coming. So, um, anybody have any questions? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, if I remember right, it was it was dependent on how many towns were going to get involved in the CPC and that, that would bring down the number of how much we would get. So I don't know what that looks like anymore. I mean, in the beginning, obviously, it was a it was a nice match that the, the state was giving but yeah what, if, what is the numbers there? if you look on page three of the oh, uh, financial oh it's in here yeah um, of the financial report that was prepared by the finance director oh okay so in the beginning you're right it was a hundred percent match which is why everybody jumped on it oh okay as more communities have uh participated that match went from a hundred percent uh down to as low as 17 percent in gain, fiscal right? 18. Mm -hmm. So right now, the estimated match for fiscal 23 is 25%. Uh, well, that's still good, though. So, I mean, it's still, you know, 25% return on your money. You know, uh, that's still pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, and it's really designed to encourage funding of projects that otherwise may not ever rise to the level of priority. Things, you know, affordable housing, historic preservation, and... Um, and uh, 
uh, recreational facilities. That's why I always try to point out at these meetings where people say, well, you guys are talking about a fire engine that you have to, you're asking me to issue debt for, or a tight tank project at the DPW for a half million dollars. Why can't we use these funds for those projects? And the simple answer is the Community Preservation Act prohibits it. You can only use it for those three categories. And in fact, you're required each year to put a minimum of 10% of your new revenues into each of those three categories. So you can't spend it all on recreation. You have to spend each year at least 10% on affordable housing and 10% on historic <laughs> preservation, which is why in order to meet those minimums, you heard Jeff talk about one of the articles is to put $77,000 into the, into the historic preservation reserve. So if you don't have a project to fund to meet your minimum 10% in each of those three categories, you're allowed to put it into a reserve and it sets it aside until you have a project that you, know, you might want to save your money up for a historic preservation project or an affordable housing project. So the town uh, finance director who's here is the one who maintains all those artificial buckets to make sure that we comply with the act but really the bigger issue here uh, that is important to communicate is that the Community Preservation Act is only for those three spending categories, historic preservation, affordable housing, and recreational facilities. You can't spend it on roads, you can't spend it on fire engines, you can't spend it on DPW trucks by law. So, If you look at this chart, it will show kind of the breakdown of those numbers that were on the three of the revenue budget and where the funds have gone into different projects. And so the affordable housing is the smallest in terms of what's been spent, but that's also where some of the reserves are right now. So with the projects coming up, possibly with White Cliffs, possibly with some other habitat, um, that will be added to. But it shows it's been nearly $3 million in state match over the course of the time that uh, the people have had this act here in town it, it's fascinating to see that it dropped down in 2018 the 17 percent now it came up all the way up to last year at 43 percent on a match so it's what happens is at the end of the year uh, sometimes the, there's a supplemental budget you know just like we finish out the year and we have free cash yeah. we use our free cash for mostly capital when the state has a budget surplus uh sometimes they uh, they pull these numbers up Oh, so, so they can put they, it into this. That's usually what happens is that the is no. after the fact there's a supplemental budget where they try to get those numbers uh, up. The other thing that happened when you saw when you see a big decrease is um, I don't recall what year it was, but when the city of Boston adopted the CPC, <laughs> it was like a giant sucking sound. All the money went <laughs> east of us yeah. to Boston. And, uh, and that's why you've seen, there's been a number of uh, bills that have been floated around over the last couple of years about how to get the numbers back up in terms of the percentage match. Because again, in the beginning it was 100%, and yeah. that was the best deal you could possibly ask for. But now that there's so many communities participating in large communities like Boston, you're just, you're seeing that money, it doesn't go as far. And it, basically the end result is the percentage match diminishes over time. But when you see it bouncing around and you see it bounce back up, it's because the state at the end of the year has a supplemental budget and they put some money towards that. Because they do want to encourage people to continue participating in the program. It's one of the main mechanisms by which they uh, incentivize affordable housing developments. So. Thank you. I just want for clarification mention, I said historic preservation, affordable housing, and recreation. It's open space and recreation. We've spent a lot of money over the years acquiring open space in this town, which is a great way to preserve um, you know, the green spaces that we do have left uh, from future development. And anything like that that is uh, purchased, either historic preservation or open space, has to have a permanent restriction on it. How does a, a building in town qualify for historic preservation? By age. Strictly by age? Yep. What's that age? Do you it's know? 100 years. This building you're in right here qualifies. We've used some of uh, CPC funds to do uh, replacements the front of the building. We repointed the brick around this uh, place. 
Uh, we've done a few projects in, in this uh, in this building. Okay. So those uncommitted reserves, could we tap that for our boiler? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's 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 it, the projects that we do come forward with or have historically. It's tailored towards preserving the building. You know, the, the historic aspects of the building. To the best of our ability. Keeping it hot doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you built a fireplace. I, I could use a nice fireplace in the office. It would really add to the ambiance. <laughs> I, I've just heard some rumors that there might be a building coming back into the town's possession in the near future. Just wondering if that would qualify. You think about 4 West Main Street? Yes. No. No. Because that's not at the original historic building. Gotcha. That burned down in 1980 yeah. Yeah. and was rebuilt. So that is not, although it's a historic replica, it's not an actual historic building. That would so it's got to be the original. Now, uh, White Cliffs, on the other hand, you know, if you were going to do something there, that would qualify. So. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. You good? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate that was your time. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate the cover. Sure. Sure. Next on our agenda is the finance office in undistributed expenses, employee benefits, and debt budgets for fiscal year 2024 budget presentation. I assume we're hearing from Mr. Jason Little. Sure. Why don't you come on up and join us? Lisa Trost here with me. She's the uh, treasurer collector. Hi. Hello. Just uh, by way of orientation, in terms of your packet, uh, you have two. You have two documents. One is the finished budget pages. It says finance department on the top, which uh, director will walk you through. And the other is a uh, two-page spreadsheet with all the calculations so you don't have to figure out what the percentage and dollar increases are in, in those lines. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. All right, thanks, John. Uh, well, thanks for having me here. We're getting started with the uh, Finance Department budget. And um, as you folks know, the Finance Department is uh, composed of uh, the, the Treasurer Collector, the Board of Assessors, and the Town Accountant. And, uh, I consecutively serve as the town accountant as well as being the finance director. So I oversee the the day-to-day uh, the -day of the, these departments, and we have department heads running them, uh, Lisa being one of them. She's the treasurer collector. Um, we recently hired a, a new uh, principal assessor. His name's uh, Leo K Lee K K Omanavong, and um, he just started in January. So. Uh, He's been here a really long time. He's already um, at the one month mark, so he's, he's doing a great job to get the ground running, um, as has Lisa. And how long have you been here, Lisa? Just over a year. All right, so gla glacial yeah. terms. So <laughs> yes. So um, anyway, we, we're fully staffed in, in the finance department, and um, the good news is um, our budget is only going up 7.75%. Uh, and that amounts to $63,000, and that's more than most years. And there's some things that are behind that that I just wanted to call out to you folks. Um, the first being um, the Treasury Department is up $40,000, uh, and that's 12% on their budget. Um, they're not going on a spending spree. What that is is we're, we're moving um, postage for tax bills from the Public Buildings Department which is now consolidated within DPW. So the portion of tax bills, um, the postage for tax bills is moving to the Treasurer's Department. And that amount is about $20,000. So, so that's 20 of the 40. Um, 10 of the 40 is also associated with us um, adding contractual services for a tax title attorney. Um, right now, the tax title attorney, we've the way that we've employed the tax title attorney has been um, paying for it through the uh, town council appropriation. So we felt it was important going forward with the, uh, the demands that are placed on the town council appropriation to segregate these two, two amounts and um, have, give the treasurer, the uh, treasurer collector, the authority to use the tax title attorney if they need to do a tax taking. So that, that accounts for another 10000 of the, the, the of the $40,000 that's uh, an increase. If I could just interrupt you. Sure. Just like we do with every budget, the, what Jason is 
going through is on page 2-17. There's one paragraph explaining to you what's in motion. Um, so uh, that's basically what he's walking you through right now. So I see some, a lot of you taking notes furiously. Oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's in our document, yeah. It's, uh, it's 2-17, significant budget changes. The three things that Jason's focusing on is included right there. Uh, my understanding is those three things are because those funds were originally accounted in a different place and they've moved. They're not new. The first one is uh, we spent a long time with DPW talking about the facilities department. So when we carved up that public buildings, in public buildings was, um, was uh, postage. So right. of the 62,000 or 63,000 roughly increase in the department, 21 of that is just moving money that from one to another. Yeah. It's okay. budget neutral. Right. Uh, the other two uh, are, uh, well, G generally the $10,000 moving for the tax title attorney is, is budget neutral because that, those are expenses that would show up elsewhere. So it's, it's bas that's basically budget neutral. But we have, um, just for transparency, we, our, our, our town council budget and expenses have uh, exceeded recently. So right. we're moving this over into this budget so they control it, which is really where it belonged. And frankly, we needed the capacity in the town council budget for ongoing litigation. Uh, so, so that is a it, it, that is a net increase. I would I would I would say. Okay. We just want people to be clear. So we're putting it there, but we still we didn't reduce the town council budget because we needed that capacity there as well. Still. But the 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 pressures to increase are not on the tax attorney side. They're on the. They're on the general litigation, general litigation side, side. Right. mostly okay. uh, some, some ongoing uh, planning board litigation that we're down to the last, uh, we're down to the last um, piece of litigation regarding Zero Bartlett. Uh, the town was not successful in that litigation. It was remanded back to the planning board. The right. town council is still supporting the planning board through this final uh, process. So we're hopeful that those costs will will taper off for the balance of fiscal 2023 right. unless new litigation comes on. Okay. Um, but, uh, but that's the reason for the split. Okay. And uh, the, the last uh, major increase in the budget was uh, we've added some contractual services to be able to uh, hire a, a professional appraiser if we have um, cases at the ATB that the, the this is within the assessor's budget because uh, we have um, uh, some, some very large um, commercial properties are our top taxpayers. So if they file a case, they, they usually have um, tax reps that work for them. So they're in, they work on contingency and there's an incentive for them to file a, ATB cases. So we need to be able to have uh, solid values to defend our, our values and you know, limit the number of abatements we give back to, okay. to the largest taxpayers. So okay. that's within the, in the assessor's budget and that's, that's basically behind the, the increase in, in, in that line. Okay. Years ago, we didn't really have much in, uh, in, in regard to those, uh, but now that we have some very large taxpayers like the mall and, and uh, a few others, yeah. we're finding they're almost just every year they just file uh, because it's almost like out, refer to them almost like ambulance chasers, you know, that there's folks that will file in the hopes to get something and uh, we want to make sure that our assessors uh, have the resources to, if they need to get an appraisal, get an appraisal. What's happened is years past is we've had to cobble money in from contractual services lines in the finance department to, to do these, but these are large parcels and the appraisals aren't uh, cheap but mm -hmm. it's money well spent on the front end that could literally save you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the back end, so. Okay. So um, overall, uh, there's, there's nothing to report really with the town accountant department. That's, that's a 4%, but that's mainly just uh, standard wage increases that are included within there. Um, so uh, I don't know if you folks have any questions about the finance department, but I, I don't really have much more to present with respect to the department. Any questions? I have one comment that I would like to make because uh, I want the community to fully appreciate the work that Jason and his staff does. Uh, we've replaced them last you know year or so, our treasurer collector, our assessor, and the assistant town accountant which is almost uh, everybody except Jason. 
and uh, which means he's had to, to onboard staff. Uh, we did a lot of that during the pandemic. And in addition, uh, Jason has done a phenomenal job for us because he's had to do that while complying with the CARES Act reporting, the ARPA reporting, the FEMA reimbursements and all that. The workload has been pretty extensive on that department and really uh, falling on Jason's shoulders. And I just, there's no way this town would function uh, without him. And uh, I just want people to appreciate the work that he's done and, and what the staff has done over the last, you know, particularly the last couple of years. But it, really Jason's done a fantastic job for us as he has since all along. But these last couple of years, um, I'm, you know, nights and weekends, the lights are on. If it's not my office, it's, it's his office. So I just want people to appreciate the work that, that's been done. Oh, yes, yeah, we know it. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate those comments. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. And, and I just, I, I want to, I want to share some of the credit with the staff. Um, Lisa's work, works tirelessly, um, and and it's a lean staff. And it, I mean, we we have nine FPEs within the department, yeah. including me. Um, everybody works really hard and has come together throughout the, the pandemic to get all of our work done. And we're. You know, we got a great team, so I'm thankful for that. We had a good reputation here for the town of Northborough. So I was thankful that we were able to recruit high quality candidates like Lee and, and Lisa to come here to replace our, our uh, departing um, department heads. So. Just to give you a little bit of insight how difficult it is for, to recruit these positions, we were willing to pay a recruiter uh, to help us out and he respectfully declined because he didn't feel like he could get candidates for us. But the town, on its reputation, and I don't want to speak for Lisa, but I was thrilled when she surfaced, uh, um, as well as Lee, these are folks that uh, are coming to Northboro because of our reputation, largely. Uh, and they want to learn an organization that, that does things correctly. So It's amazing what a positive culture will do for for any organization so thank you you guys do a wonderful job thank you any other questions yeah I do what happened to all the awards yeah oh yeah I don't know where they are <laughs> I'm, <taking them> <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm taking them with me yeah they say so. <laughs> going to box <laughs> uh, no I think they're I think they're actually hung up Somewhere. Well, yeah. that's part of the reputation, right? Instead of leaving <laughs> it in the vacuum. So, yeah. So, I do have uh, uh, copies of this is the undistributed, which is the second portion that Jason is here to talk about. And primarily, the two uh, aspects that are you're most interested in uh, is the uh, health insurance, because it's a budget buster. Uh, as well as debt and, uh, to some extent, you know, our retirement pension as well. Okay, so, so John, I'll, I'll just get started. Um, starting with the, the, the biggest increase, um, it's debt service. Uh, that's going up about 10% this year. And um, we've had a number of years without any new debt. And what the 10% is, is uh, a portion of the fire station land article. And we're required under, under Mass General Law to, um, in the third year since we've issued temporary debt for it, make a, make a principal pay down that would, would ap approximate what a principal payment on a bond would be. So that's approximately $200,000. So as, as time goes on, debt goes, debt, oh, sure. debt declines over over time as we pay it off we haven't had any new significant debt so this is the first time that we've seen kind of an increase within debt service so um, that's 100 percent associated with the fire station and and the land article um, but just to be clear that's a that's a legal requirement it's not like anything new has been acquired or any cor new correct just correct. a legal yeah we, thing we need to we meet the obligations do. that we have and we need to pay down some of the principal that we owe. And we can't just continue paying um, interest only per perpetually. And as you know, that, that project just got delayed due to the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, in an ideal world, we'd be building that, uh, that structure right now. So, uh, so we were doing temporary, uh, you know, temporary borrowing longer than we originally anticipated. So it's time to make a principal. Right. You have a question? 
question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, is there a document describing the debt payments? Um, the the uh, that packet that got handed down with the undistributed expenses. So you go to page six dash, starting at six dash twelve. There's a pretty extensive list of the six of the town's existing okay. debt. There's a listing on the six dash thirteen of all the issuances, all the outstanding debt. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. But what's, what's telling is, as Jason commented, you know, we've been watching our debt, our level of debt service dropping, dropping, dropping. It's actually dropped <coughs> below where we would actually want it to be. And it, you know, so it's going to have to come back up once the fire station project comes online and gets bonded. What we try to do is we, we try to, as projects get paid off, we bring new ones on. And so it smooths it out so that you only have a little bit of a ripple like that. But we've actually paid off, and we're going to have to come back up um, once that fire station comes in. So if you look at on page 6-12, you can see, you know, in fiscal 2020, with 2.66 million in, in outstanding debt and debt service. And then in 2023, it's, you know, 2 million. We've been paying it off, and now it's going to go up to 2.1 because we have to issue the debt for that portion of that, of that project. But in here is all of the all of the information regarding debt service over those three or four pages and gfoa uh government finance office association made us actually expand this uh section to give you more information so everything you want to know about debt is in these four pages right here okay thank you all right, so everybody's uh, looking at those pages with rapt attention, so I, I don't want to interrupt anybody's concentration, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, maybe I'll give you a minute to move on to the next topic. Well, the only thing I could think of when John was explaining that is, is debt doesn't care if there's a, a pandemic. So you still got to pay those off. You know, obviously, no new, new projects going on during that time. So you're going to see a decline and then the ramp up as we start moving forward with those projects. Exactly. One of the things, if you look on page 6-14, uh, is the statutory debt limit. Just to give you a sense of order of magnitude and where we stand as a community. So by statute, uh, Northborough's uh, debt limit is, uh, is um, 181 million is what we could be issuing. And right now, as of June of 2022, uh, it's 22 million. So, at, on a percentage basis, we're below 5%, uh, 4%, roughly, of our operating budgets going to debt. And our policy, our own internal policy, is that general fund uh, debt is not to exceed 50% of the operating budget. Um, in net debt, which means after we get reimbursement for usually a school building project or something like that, uh, eight to ten percent. So we really, our policy is debt service eight to ten percent is where we want to live if we're on a regular basis investing in our buildings. And right now we are below five percent. So we would have been right on target had the pandemic not hit, and we would have moved forward with that project. You know, but um, so we are poised as a corporate entity right now. We are. Uh, in a perfect position to issue debt for this upcoming large project. Mm -hmm. All right, so one, one of the other things that usually happens is that um, w the other budget buster we have is the Worcester Regional Retirement Assessment, and um, we're on a, a funding plan um, th through uh, 20, 36 for the Worcester Regional Retirement System to become fully funded. Um, it became, it came to light in the past um, that a lot of the local retirement systems were underfunded and uh, it became kind of a crisis. So for a number of years, we've seen an increase for, of the retirement assessment of about 10% as they, they move toward trying to be fully funded by 2040. Um, that, and that's what's in the law is 2040. 
but um, the, the retirement system that we belong to, we're, we're one of about 100 members that belong to the, the multi-employer um, pension system. Um, they've adopted a plan to get fully funded by 2036, and overall, their assessments are going up 10% every year. Um, somehow, actuarially, within those numbers, um, we're only going to be going up 2% this year. So we went up much less than the, the, the rest of the communities that, that belong to the, the pension system. So it's good news for us. Um, you know, that, that was a, a welcome thing this year that um, it's only going up 2% when typically off the top we're expecting there to be a 10% increase in that, in that line. Um, and the other uh, large uh, budget buster is typically health insurance. Um, right now, um, we're working on our renewal for, for rates starting July 1st for our active plans. We have approximately 300 uh, employees that, that participate in health insurance. Um, the town's share of, of a family plans about $20,000, so you, you can see how that has a, a tremendous multiplier effect um, if, if that goes up significantly. Um, within health insurance, we cover retirees, and um, we had an event this year whereby the um, most expensive plan that the town offered for, for retirees for a Medicare supplemental plan, um, Tufts Insurance decided they weren't were going to discontinue it. So the treasurer's office, through their hard work, worked with all of the retirees that were on that plan to transition them to, to other plans. And um, in the end, it, it wasn't a town's choice to cancel that plan, but it was Tufts. But we were able to find alternate plans, and I, as far as I know, everybody is, was covered acceptably by all the other plans, and the town and, and the retirees themselves are going to be saving money as a result of that. Uh, it's possibly $300,000 of savings this year that the that the town's realizing from that change. And it was just um, nothing intentional that the town did, but it's just uh, happenstance good luck that we were able to align all of these retirees with, with one of the existing plans that we have that, that ends up costing less. Um, our, we went through a, um, a JPA with the schools and the, the town of Southboro, and that was um, transitioned us from, from Fallon to Harvard Pilgrim last year. And we're on the second year of that, so we, we haven't gotten all of the data for the claims and so forth. So we're still working with the consultant on that, but they have some pretty good idea that we're going to be somewhere between 5 and 8% and increase for, for renewals for next year. Looking at that, um, at the same time, we've had lower usage among our active employees, so we have fewer people utilizing the insurance. So that, that's, that's another thing that's, there's a little bit of volatility behind those numbers because people could come in, come off, and you know somebody that didn't take health insurance leaves, somebody else comes in and does take it, that's $20,000 at every time for a family plan. Um, <coughs> So right now we have um, we're carrying a zero percent increase with, within those numbers based on the the change in the retiree plans <clears throat> and um, the, the the lower uh, roster that we have right now. So um, it's relatively good news for for health insurance this year. If I can direct your attention to page six dash four, that gives you kind of a really nice history. You can look back at our health insurance budget increases going back to 2010 through fiscal 2024. And throughout that time, the town's health insurance budget on average has gone up 2.69%, which is phenomenal. Um, the comment that Jason made, I don't want that to be minimized by making the changes that were made on the retiree health insurance, the retirees had the same coverage. They saved money, and then we saved money. And it's because Lisa, uh, our treasurer collector, and her staff called every single retiree and walked them through the entire plan, the transition, why they'd be okay, verified that every doctor, every prescription, that everything was going to transfer over. You know how many complaints we got? Not one. $300,000 worth of savings 
is a 5% increase on our health insurance budget that was negated. That's why right now what Jason said, our, we don't have our final uh, rate renewal for the insurance this year, but it's going to probably be somewhere 5 to 7%. That basically negated a, a good chunk of uh, that increase. Uh, again, it happened in fiscal 2023, but that savings is rolling forward in the, current, uh, in the upcoming fiscal year as well. That coupled with the fact that, I don't know how to say this, but we, we're hiring a lot of young people who are still on their parents' insurance under, under, the, uh, under um, uh, the Affordable Care Act. They can stay on till 26. We sort of encourage them to stay on. Um, they save money. We save money. Um, so uh, because of a lot, a lot of those changes over, particularly in public safety most recently, um, that's the other piece, and you know we've we've had uh, quite a few uh, positions turn over. And as Jason said, you know you know you, you get you get ten of those positions at twenty thousand dollars a pop. Sometimes you know it adds up quickly. So so that's all worked in our in our favor. So what we try to do uh, again on page six four, you can see when the budget increases are going to be substantial and it's going to cause us a problem. We go back to the employees and we do plan design changes. In 2012, the teachers contributed 5% more. Um, multiple years of plan design changes. We consolidated carriers. We formed the, joint, formed the Joint Procurement Association with the town of Southboro and the regional high school. You know, we put it out to bid again this year. You know, it's a constant management uh, activity to try to keep that health insurance. But I don't think you'll see anybody that's done as good of a job, frankly, uh, at 2.69%, again, on a budgetary basis. But health insurance goes crazy. You know, it, it disrupts the entire budget. And so being able to actively manage it, and you don't always know where the opportunities are going to come. Like, we didn't plan on the retiree move, but, um, but Lisa and her staff were able to make that smooth so that we got people to move to plans that were cheaper for them and, and, and by association, cheaper for us. And the information cost when it comes to health insurance is incredible because it's very personal. It's down to what's your medication and who's your specialist. And you have to assure them that, that all their doctors, all their specialists, and their particular medication is covered to the same degree it was under the other plan. It's just a huge amount of outreach, uh, but not a... 300,000 in savings and not a single complaint. It's fantastic work by, by Lisa in her office. Oh, and in, in case you were worried, we did look at the number of people that were going to be turning 26, and we did it half of those yeah. in, yeah. within our numbers. So there's not going to be a cliff that we're going to reach where, where we're in a deficit because of people aging back into the health insurance. <laughs> Well, if you want, you can take my two kids. I call them walking co-pays anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's undistributed. Uh, there's building liability, um, a few, you know, uh, other things in here, but they're not, uh, again, they're not a lot, a lot of movement there. Uh, we do include in this all of the Warren articles, but you know, so if you're looking at down at, at the bottom line on page 6-1, and it looks like a massive you know, budget increase, it, it's somewhat artificial. We're just trying to bring all these different uh, budgets into one place so you can kind of see them. But like the Warren articles, you know, most of those are capital projects in nature, so they're not recurring budgets. Um, that's why Jason focused on the, you know, the real recurring budgets, the health insurance, you know, the Worcester Regional Retirement, the debt, you know, things that are, that are in motion. But we try, to, we try to explain everything that has a budgetary impact, and undistributed is sort of the catch-all for, for those things. Any questions? Good. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work.
Thanks, thanks for having us. Thanks for the support. While Jason is still here, we do have some news that's hot off the press. Uh, the governor did release her uh, House One budget. So it was due March 1st. Uh, she did release it a little bit early. Uh, just uh, at first blush, uh, it's about a 2% increase, which is, you know, our budget model is carrying 1%. Uh, but that 2% is negated a little bit by some of the assessments. So state aid, they give you money with one hand, and then they charge you, back charge you for things like mosquito control and being near an MBTA station and things of that nature. So when you, when you work all that out, it's less than 2%, but <coughs> it's not going to make or break our overall budget. Uh, as I always say, when we uh, approve our budget, we won't know what our final state numbers are until um, sometime probably June. Um, particularly given this cycle is, is moving very late. Uh, but any modest amount of state aid that we receive beyond what we're carrying in our budget, and we're going to, we'll carry the 2% uh, in the budget. It doesn't mean we'll spend more. All that means is the tax impact will be less. We're still holding to the budget, but we, now we get a little bit more state aid. Uh, once town meeting is set, just for viewers at home, if we were to get a substantial amount of state aid, which I would fall out of the chair and hit my head if that happened. But if you did, any, any amount that you get above what you budgeted when you passed your budget at town meeting, it can only be used to reduce the tax impact. This year, based on what you heard from the superintendent at your last meeting, at a, about a 5%, 4.9% increase for K-8, due largely to special education costs that he doesn't control, you know, there's going to be some you know, significant budget impact. So in December, we were forecasting it somewhere in the $500, $550 you know, potential increase. So if we get a little bit more state aid, it might knock another 8 or $9 off the bill, um, but it's not going to be earth shattering. So just so folks know. Uh, we are, uh, I also do want to, to mention that we are meeting, the Board of Selectmen has the, um, our new delegation coming in on uh, February 27th, so next Monday's uh, Board of Selectmen meeting. Uh, at that meeting, uh, we'll be going through our... It's going by February 27th, huh? I'm sorry, March 13th, the next Selectmen's meeting. I'm working, I got financial planning appropriations to the Board of Selectmen, I'm trying to keep all the days straight, thank you. The next select Board of Selectmen meeting is March 13th. At that meeting, uh, uh, at the meeting on the 27th, they approved the legislative priorities letter, which I emailed to you, so you all should have seen it. At the meeting on March 13th, the delegation will come in and we'll walk them through that letter. The two main components are more Chapter 90 transportation funds for sidewalks, drainage, and roadways. And the other is just general state aid in the form of Chapter 70 um, you know, uh, aid, unrestricted, and then various accounts like special education circuit breaker, regional transportation, things of that nature. So I encourage you to read the letter and, uh, and if you have an interest to tune in uh, to that meeting to hear what they have to say. Generally, the governor's budget is the low bar. The big thing for us going into this upcoming cycle is um, trying to get the uh, minimum aid per student up. It's $30. Last year, we were able to get the uh, legislature to move that to $60, but under the governor's budget, it's $30. So I'll share, uh, I'll share some statistics with you um, prior to the meeting on the 13th, but uh, overall, education funding is going up in the order of like $458 million, and roughly uh, well over 70, 70 plus percent of that is going to 10 school districts or 10 percent of the school districts so it, it's by design that the money is going towards the districts in need but what it means is 67 percent of all the other districts are are going to um only get 41 million dollars of that money to split isn't that that's mind-boggling when you think about that so the 67 percent our minimum aid communities are all going to share 41 million dollars but it's going up 448 million dollars total so that's why i always say to you folks 
why when you hear and the, the chapter 70 is going up over 8% statewide. But that's why when you see these numbers and you hear the releases from the governor's office and the legislature talking about all these increases in local aid, then I always have to explain why we're only going to see 1%, maybe 2%, depending on what they charge us for assessments. That's going to be the story that we need to talk to our legislative delegation about. Why they need, since we're not a Student Opportunity Act community, why they need to increase that minimum aid. And what I'm seeing for the first time, uh, we had a MMA fiscal policy committee meeting yesterday. And what I'm seeing for the first time is the community, the minimum aid communities are sort of at their wits end, that they're not getting any increases to speak of. And all millions and millions are going to a handful of communities that arguably need it, but the state has to spread it out a little bit more. We can't, we can't receive next to nothing year after year. I think we're in a year that was kind of kind of make or break that a little bit. So the legislature historically has been a little bit more receptive in, in increasing that number. It's thirty dollars in the governor's budget. The legislature increased it to sixty dollars per student in FY23. The MMA and the town is asking for a hundred dollars per student. So that when it comes to the discussion about state aid and chapter seventy education, that's where the that's where the money is. And that's where the discussion is. We're not going to get it in any other form other than minimum aid per student. So, again, it's all in the letter. I hope you read it and I hope you show up and provide some support. I don't you know, have anything to add on the state aid front, Jason. Do you know if there's any difference in the level of support from the governor's office now that we have a new governor? Is there any difference or? or You'd say it's supported by the legislature, and is it supported by the, the governor? And Yes. Yeah, okay. The governor, as part of her campaign, made a commitment to funding the Student Opportunity Act, as did the legislature. So, and again, I don't want to beat up on it. It, it. From a policy standpoint, they, well, they're doing it so that they don't get lawsuits for civil rights violations. That's why the Student Opportunity Act was passed and why all that money is going to those disadvantaged districts. And again, from a public policy standpoint, you want to see the districts that need it receive it. Mm -hmm. But it can't be at the exclusion of, you know, 67% are right. getting next to nothing. Here's the thing. The legislature, for all the money, billions and billions of dollars, right, uh, the Chapter 78 increase is like $458 million for, for this upcoming uh, budget. For 10 to $20 million more, they could they could bump that uh, minimum aid and make everybody feel good and so that's why we're really pushing it it's not big money and the grand scale right. and they arguably have it right now so that's why we need to really press our delegation they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to deliver that to us the governor uh is not so much okay thank you it's complicated Yes. Any questions? Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank Uh, next on our agenda is review of annual town meeting warrant articles. So in your packet is the, uh, the memo that went to the Board of Selectmen on Monday. Um, this is sort of the first pass of uh, the articles that we're anticipating that are going to come forward to town meeting. Uh, some of them could come off, there could possibly be one added. Um, Basically, by and large, at this stage, we're looking at 51 articles for the upcoming town meeting. And just briefly walking you through, the structure of the warrant is always the same. It's the operating budgets, capital budgets, CPC, and then zoning. And then mixed in there are, you know, a few odd articles that come up each year. So article uh, articles 1 through uh, 13 
uh, one through one through twelve rather are the standard articles that appear every year. They're basically the budgets for the schools, the town, uh, the revolving funds. Uh, it includes the appropriation committee, this committee's emergency reserve fund, as well as a contribution to the stabilization fund. Something new this year that you haven't seen before is Article 13, and this is an appropriation of the opioid settlement fund. So the town participated in the opioid lawsuits, and we are receiving um, we're receiving monies now through those settlements. There's another round of settlements that are just getting approved. I'm completing the paperwork for those this week. Uh, they're settlements with CVS and Walgreens and a few of the other distributors. So additional funds will be coming. It's really, uh, it's crazy because depending on the structure by each of the uh, companies that settled, some are paying it up front, some are spreading it out, some are paying it on an accelerated program. So the amount of money that we're getting initially is substantial, and then it should level out almost like a debt payment out for the next, you know, for the next 20 years or so. So right now, I believe we have received about $170,000 roughly. And again, this is front-loaded money. That's not what we're going to receive. the The annual the annual money is going to be like probably 30 grand or less, you know, moving forward. So here's the uh, the complicating factor. Department of Revenue put forward an article uh, a, uh, in the budget a, uh, a statute change that would allow the town to create a special revenue account for the opioid settlement money. As you can imagine, as part of the settlement, you can't, again, spend the money on roadways or fire engines. It has to be used for addiction-related, uh, recovery-related addiction prevention programs. Okay? So we have to segregate these funds. Department of Revenue said the legislature, we need to allow towns to create a special revenue account so the money comes in, it stays in that account, it gets spent out of that, and then allows you to clearly report back how the money was used. Well, it never got approved. So what we're left to do is we are going to uh, uh, just create an appropriation uh, uh, article that segregates those funds and puts them aside. That allows us to comply with the law, and then the town can figure out how they would like to expend those funds. One of the things that we're working with through the health department is pairing up with the high school in Southborough to see, since the high school is a regional shared with Southborough, to see if we can uh, use our monies collectively, either to hire a physician or a program that would work kind of seamlessly through all the schools. Um, again, that's just in its, uh, its uh, initial stages. Nothing's been decided on yet. But anyway, that's why that article. If we don't have this article, what will happen is that 171000 will close out the free cash. And then after the fact, when we do our free cash plan, I'm going to have to carve out the opioid money. And that will just complicate our free cash plan and the routine that we're in. It's better to carve that money out on the front end and set it aside. That's what this article accomplishes. Um, there's an article, uh, 14 is uh, senior tax relief. Uh, there is a program uh, by state uh, statute that allows for uh, reverse mortgages, essentially, so someone can stay in their house and defer their tax bill and, uh, and up to 50% of the value of the home, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, pay it off when they pass away or the property transfers. The income limits uh, for that program haven't been touched in a very long time. So the point with this is to modify those in the hopes that more people will be able to take advantage of that. Article 15 through Article 24 are the capital improvement uh, Articles. Uh, so these are the various projects that are going forward to town meeting for funding. I forwarded under separate cover to you a copy of the Financial Planning Committee's report. It has their recommending approval of all these articles, and you can read the report and see their rationale for that. Not part of the town of Northborough's capital improvement plan, but yet a capital project is Article 25. That's the Algonquin Regional High School Athletic Complex. Now, superintendent presented that to you at your meeting last week. That is a standalone article. 
Uh, I do believe uh, I'm waiting on confirmation from the superintendent, but I think they've had another round of, as the design progresses, they get another round of cost estimates, and that cost estimate has gone up a little bit. Northboro share has gone up about 262000 if I'm reading the materials correctly. So um, we'll get you an update on that, uh, on that project as well. So 13 Church Street, this is Article 26. Uh, this is the old, old fire station on Church Street that we are, we tried to, we went through a process to surplus it to see if it can be redeveloped as part of some adjacent properties. Unfortunately, as part of that, as part of that a process to surplus the property, it, the abutter at WCD Garage was questioning the property line and it turns out that the property line is incorrect going back to 1910, a 1910 widening of Church Street. So the pump station that has been on that property since 1990s is partially on the abutters property because of that. So I've spent, and the DPW director has spent the last eight or nine months, A, getting an agreed upon uh, survey uh, because they, we had a survey he had a survey, we had to hire a third party to kind of figure it out. They did determine that a pin, a pin was moved in 1910. So long story short, uh, we've negotiated <clears throat> an easement for, it's a sliver of land, excuse me. It's a triangular sliver of land. Uh, and we were able to negotiate and allow, and allow the butter to tie into the sewer and waive the betterment fee and in exchange, you will give us an easement. And so uh, I have a temporary memorandum of agreement that allows us to move forward with surplusing that property. The Board of Selectmen at Monday's meeting approved the memorandum of agreement uh, for the easement, but because it's real property, it has to be finalized at town meeting. So I envision this would be kind of a housekeeping matter. It's, it's not big money and it's a very small sliver, but boy, did that cause a ton of headaches for the last you know eight months what should have been a quick and easy surplusing of the property and redevelopment got delayed with a lot of extra work to, to get this resolved the good news is we have an agreement it's moving forward article 27 uh, was voted by the Board of Selectmen uh, to um, have a warrant article change that would effectively uh, change the name of the Board of Selectmen to the select board a gender neutral designation. Uh, Article 28 is removing a residency requirement for the town administrator. Just so everybody here is clear, I'm the one that's proposing this and brought it to the board. Um, the market for town administrators and town managers is very tight. This requirement goes back to 1970. There's only a dozen communities that have a residency requirement that they're holding to at this point. If the town of Northboro holds a residency requirement, you will not get a good candidate pool at all so um, so I recommended to the board this requires a charter change but it can be done as as does the uh, change of the name to select board so these two articles require a charter change but they can be done by a special act of the legislature we've already reached out to our delegation they'll sponsor the bills and they're relatively they're not controversial so we're not opening up the charter, we're not creating a charter commission, we're not looking, we're just doing two special acts that will uh, uh, accomplish these two specific goals. So, but in order to do that, town meeting needs to approve the application to the legislature for those special acts. Anybody have any questions on those two? I just want, I don't want people to, whenever it's something like this happens, people sometimes will say, well, what's going on here? Why are we trying to do this? I just want folks to know this is coming as a town manager you it's going to be tough to find a you know a good candidate pool that residency requirement will constrain your pool artificially and just so we're clear you know this requirement goes back to 1970 where you know the husband moves and the wife just packs up her aprons and follows some most couples are two careers you know don't follow each other anymore so uh, having the ability for people to commute reasonably 
is something I think the board, uh, the, com the community should, should uh, think about. Anyway, moving on, Article 29, Consolidated Personal Bylaw, that's just the uh, wage increase for the non-union folks, which is by formula under the bylaw is the average of the union contracts. Uh, and then you're into the community preservation, so Article 30 through Article 35 are the uh, ones that you just heard tonight from Jeff Leland presenting. Article 36 uh, is an amendment to the Earth Removal uh, Code. And then really Article 36 through the balance, there's uh, I think 16 or 17 zoning related articles. Um, so uh, I don't have much more detail on those yet. Planning Board is still um, uh, debating those. Uh, so the, there might be some movement on, uh, on one or more of them. Uh, but we'll, once that is finalized, we'll get you information on those. But, uh, but so there's a rather significant number of zoning articles coming forward. I, my understanding is a lot of them are relatively minor housekeeping uh, type articles. One is potentially the rezoning of White Cliffs. If you don't rezone White Cliffs, uh, it can only be used for a nursing home or a residence. It, it's the use as a, as a uh, facility, a function hall facility expired it was grandfathered it hasn't been in use for two years so that uh, grandfathering has expired so if the town does not rezone white cliffs that parcel is going to be very limited uh things that you can do with that for a reuse so but anyway that's the warrant as it's shaping up uh, obviously this is a first pass at the meeting on the 13th the board will you know we'll have the full text of the warrant uh, the articles and the board will close the warrant at their meeting on March 13th. And then from there until it's posting, town council will review and finalize and the final uh, wording of the various articles will, will be put in place. So that is the town meeting warrant. So we have no, <clears throat> no citizens petitions this year? Nope, uh, none yet. Uh, citizens petitions can be submitted up until literally the moment the board votes to close the warrant. I've had them come in five minutes before the meeting or show up at a meeting um, just prior. So, but no, no citizens' petitions at this, at this juncture. So it looks like we can plan at least two nights then for the meet. Uh, for it's, a two night, it's a two night meeting depending on debate. I've been doing this for 25 years. I wish I, I'm, I'm like, a, it's like an economist predicting uh, how, how, the, uh, the, how the economy is going to do in the next year. Top 10 economists are never the top 10 the following year. Um, I've been horrible at predicting. Sometimes you get an article that you just think is just a housekeeping and somebody will want to discuss it and 45 minutes later, there you go. I think uh, a lot of the, you know, the budgets generally, I think will go pretty smoothly as they typically do. The, most of the capital articles, most are free cash, no additional tax impact, probably not a lot of discussion. Um, the athletic complex, I think in the first night you might get, you know, as far as the athletic complex, just by the virtue of that it's a large project, it's going to be a presentation and, and some discussion. So. The, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the financial planning committee, one of the selectmen read something from a, a note they're going to include. Yes, that was from the report. That's from the report for town meeting, which I emailed to the to the body. Okay. Yeah. Can this committee do something to that same effect? Yes, you have. So when we get to talk about your schedule, uh, once you vote your recommendations, the appropriations committee will have a standalone handout at town meeting, as they always do, with a transmittal letter and your recommendations. So that's your document to make it as you would like. So okay. Right. In fact, uh, today, you might not have seen it, but today, with the uh, updated schedule, I, I sent you a copy of last year's report, just so people can see, again, the structure of it. Generally, what happens is uh, my staff and I, we do the, uh, the routine stuff, so we make sure that the warrant articles are the correct number, the numbers are all correct, and that, and then we fill in when you take your votes. Uh, but then the uh, committee, usually through the chair, 
will draft. It's usually a one or two page sort of transmittal letter of, in general, you know, we're recommending this or this is of concern or that's, you know, whatever you want to highlight. That's up to the committee to do that. Okay. All right. So you can see the report from last year. Yeah. And you can also see the report uh, because I've distributed it to you by email of the financial planning committee. Again, they're limited to focusing on the capital projects. Right. Yeah. It's just, I know it's just a little bit different this year. Is there's usually more agreement among all the participating committees and boards in this year. There's not. This will be so. the, potentially the first time in 14 years that you know, we're not all on the same page going to town meeting. Any questions? Yes. Um, do we see the planner? Do no. we get a report from the planner? Yes. So uh, in your packet is the uh, an update from the uh, town planner. So she was originally on the schedule. Unfortunately, she had a, a family a conflict. Um, so I asked her to provide an update to the uh, committee regarding the downtown master plan. Again, that was sent out by email, but I gave you a hard copy tonight just so you don't have to print it. Um, one of the things that we can talk about in your schedule is uh, if you want to have her come in, we've got, we're, we're going to need to add a, a meeting or two onto your schedule, and there's a possibility to bring her in if you'd like her to, to meet her and discuss I, anything. I am interested in the uh, potential building projects both those in the uh, process and those that are completed since last year. In other words, the kind of report we used to get. Are you referring to building projects or, yeah, uh, or, like, ec you. or like, econo like an economic development update kind of a thing? Both. The what building projects are you? Are you Either doing? any. Municipal or private? Private. Okay, so you're looking for a, like a general economic development update? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I, she's updated that memo. I can uh, get that to you. Uh, Thank you. And uh, uh, and then you can just decide if you'd like her to come in, because I don't believe you've uh, you've met her yet. No. So if you would like her to come in, we can talk about that uh, when we talk about your schedule in a moment. Could you also talk about uh, that? new law about communities that are either the MBTA zoning or are adjacent and therefore must uh, have so much housing, yes. et cetera. In the memo that I asked to prepare for you, uh, she provided an update regarding the downtown, uh, the downtown visualization right. project. Right. And in there, she made reference to that, uh, the MBTA zoning okay. requirement. And I made her put it, or asked her to put it in there as a as a hyperlink. But the link is there okay. in any event, and it's in something that I've sent you previously. But I can, I'm happy to forward it again. Okay. But if you click on that, then you can read it. My suggestion is that you read, yeah, I see that you read here. the state sort of summary right. of what it is, and then when she comes in, you can you can talk to her about it. But essentially, it, re it requires us to either create some a significant amount of high density zoning in the town, or we won't be eligible for state grants like MassWorks, which is yeah. the primary grant that we're looking at for any downtown projects. So the two are connected. It's kind of connected. Yeah. yeah. And the reason is it's been that, that I'm asking about it is there's been a lot in the paper lately about communities struggling with this. I mean, you know, Brookline was written up and then there was yep. a community south that was written up about yeah. these issues. So I, I think understanding where Northboro, Northboro is or what we're thinking, how we're going to deal with it, uh, it would be useful yep. to have that. And I did, again, uh, send you when th there was an update on that. So we had to submit a preliminary plan uh -huh. to the state. It, we're not committed to anything, but basically they want to they want a progress report to what's your plan potentially yeah. for complying? And I sent that out to uh, uh, appropriations and financial planning. Again, I try to, you know, I try not to kill you guys with too much stuff, but there are things I know you're going to want to know about. So I try to send that along. But while I'm going to have see if Lori can come in on uh, on one of these upcoming meetings we'll discuss in a moment. I'll get an economic development update from her. Okay. Not a whole lot going on in that front. Um, uh, we can talk about the zoning. 
And then if you have any questions about the downtown visualization, that's still a work in progress. Uh, and she gave you a pretty thorough update on that. But if you have any questions, she can answer that as well. If the chair would like me to do that. I'm happy to request her to. That would be, that would be great. That'd be very helpful. Great. So you want to talk about your schedule? Yes. All right. So in your packet is a copy of an email I sent you with an updated schedule. So we got a couple of things that are in motion. Um, we still don't. Uh, we we still don't have. Well, let me back up. Uh, your next meeting is March eighth. On March eighth, Assabet Valley will be coming in, and the police uh, budget and the police will be coming in. I could potentially see if a glory is available on that night. That would be a good um, a good night for her to come in if she's available. I'm not sure, so I'll check on that. If not, uh, we can have her come in at a, a subsequent meeting. Um, but we are in mediation with the Joint Labor Management Committee with our fire union at the moment. Um, we're making we're making progress. Uh, but I have a mediation uh, negotiation scheduled on the 8th, which is your next meeting. And so uh, what I'd like to do is hold off on the fire budget, because if we can reach an agreement, then we're going to have to update everything. And if we can't, then I'm going to have to move money around and put it in a central account. And the next manager will have to deal with the uh, finalizing of that contract. Um, so I want to bump the fire to the following week. So the following week you did not have on your tentative schedule a meeting. That is Wednesday, March 15th. So uh, the two highlighted um, meetings are the two that I think we you need to add. So um, the 15th would allow us to get through the fire uh, budget presentation, which one way or another, I'm going to have to wrap that one up. The other is we'll know our final health insurance numbers, although from the presentation tonight, you know, it's going to be a zero increase. Uh, when we set the schedule, I wasn't sure if we were going to see something more substantial or not. Um, but we're also going to get a revised Algonquin Regional High School assessment based on the governor's budget. Preliminarily, and my understanding is our assessment is actually going to go up because although we got more state aid, the minimum local contribution that the state says we have to put towards that budget went up even more. It's mind-boggling. The chapter seventy, you know, the chapter seventy formula is, is a little bit crazy. Um, so we're going to need to talk about what that revised assessment looks like. The overall high school budget hasn't changed; it's just the state aid and the ripple effect through. You can, you should be able to ask questions about that. Um, any other presentation? So, if there's any other uh, departments that you want to hear from or you want to include, we already talked about the, the town planner. I'm going to try to fit her in on the 8th, if not on the 8th, on the 15th. And then um, Jason Little, uh, the town accountant, is going to, uh, the, the uh, finance director is going to come back. We do, we are going to have an emergency reserve transfer uh, of that request. Um, we've had a couple of building issues. One is that this building, we lost one of the two boilers. We had to replace it. Um, I can't fit that in the budget, so we're going to be looking for a transfer. The upside is, I shouldn't say this out loud, I'll knock on wood. So far, the winter has been reasonable enough. I understand we got a foot of snow coming on Saturday, <laughs> which is always the case. The moment you, the moment you say, oh, you know, it hasn't been a bad winter, that's when it becomes a bad winter. Right at the end of the tunnel is a train. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. So, uh, but, but uh, you know, at the end of the fiscal year, uh, you know, we have the ability to, uh, to move snow and ice overdrafts. To, a, to the subsequent year, raise it next year's tax bill. We also have the ability at the end of the year to make uh, interdepartmental transfers with the approval of this body and the Board of Selectmen. And as long as I've been the town administrator for 14 years, we've never kicked the can. We've always dealt with any uh, storm or, or snow and ice overages within the current fiscal year. I, I like to keep the expenses in that year fixed in that year so that we're not, we're not you know, bastardizing the data. Right? rolling expenses from one year to another. Um, so if we can do that, that would be my intention. But we can do that with snow and ice. I can't do it with the boiler. So we're going to be seeking a reserve fund transfer for that. And then uh, we could start having a preliminary discussion about your 
report and uh, and your uh, recommendations. Historically, the committee has waited to vote their final recommendations t until after the charter required joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen, which is scheduled for Monday, uh, March 27th at 7 p.m. So you've heard from all of the committees, you know overall the budget is three and a half percent. We're still trying to make sure everything fits. Um, one of the things that I am, I've made a commitment to, to the fire chief is uh, we had a staffing study that was completed in 2016 that recommended a deputy chief. Our current fire chief is getting up there in age. He has a mandatory requirement at 65. That's only a few years away. And so uh, I would like to find a way to fit that deputy chief position into the FY24 budget for, for transition planning. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a mistake if he leaves and, we're, you know, and we don't have a, a plan in place. So, uh, so as we get the final numbers on, you know, we have debt, health insurance, our retirement assessment, a few other things um, just getting finalized and not the least of which is the contract for the, for the fire personnel, I'm trying to fit that in. So, so anyway, um, so we'll do a presentation uh, on the 27th, but you've heard and seen you know, most of the big pieces, unless you, you know, want to meet with the one person department, the town clerk or something like that. Um, so we'll get the input and then my, what I'm suggesting is the other meeting is, and this is where we kind of need to decide this tonight, possible. Monday the 27th is the joint hearing that's required by charter. Then you need to vote your recommendations, typically the meeting after that. Do you want to do it, have the joint hearing on Monday, then meet on that Wednesday to discuss your recommendations, or do you want to wait till the following week? And here's why it matters. If you do it on March 29th, I'll be here. If you do it the week after on April 5th, Jason Little will be here who's fully capable. I don't think it's gonna make or break you, but um, it's two meetings in one week or you can spread it out. It's, it's up to you. Um, Jason is committed. He can be here on the 5th, on April 5th to walk you through. And so question of two meetings and availability, it's whatever the pleasure of the committee is. Can we first maybe get consensus on the meeting next uh, on the 15th? Can we lock that one up? We're going to need that to button up these loose ends. Yeah. Okay. So we will we'll lock that up. Please put that in calendar. And then the question is uh, for your, your vote and your committee recommendation report, you want to do it on March 29th or April 5th. Is there any advantage to waiting an extra week or because of information or is there won't be anything? Any advantage? I don't think there's going to be any additional information. The last bits of information are kind of flushing out over the next, you know, couple of weeks. I'm okay with the 29th then. I'm okay with the 29th too. Yeah. Same here. What? 29th. Oh, if, if you don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, I love, yeah, I love tripling up the night meetings on my last week of, in uh, working for the town. I'm just kidding. I'm happy to do that, guys. Hey, Ron, you know we're going to have a secret party. <laughs> Somebody better bring cake, oh, yeah, that's I all I can say. Um, okay, so March 15th and March 29th? Yeah. Yep. Yes? Okay. All right, we're going to lock those in. We'll have to let, uh, will you let Cable Access know those two meetings are in? Thank you. And that will, that will basically uh, fit, wrap you guys up for this budget cycle. Your own, the next meeting will be the night of town meeting. And you'll either meet at six or six thirty, uh, depending on if you have what, what what there might be to do or you might want to discuss. Uh, so you'll meet just before town meeting and then go into town meeting. And town meeting is mandatory uh, fun for all of you. So you all have to show up. Okay, great. That's all I that's all I have uh, this evening, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Just a question. Uh, you said the fire chief has to retire at 65? Yes. Is that a town thing or a state, state law? Hmm? State law. Oh, state law. What yes. about the uh, chief of police? Same thing. And how close is Bill to that? Well, when Bill was here before you, he said he won't be here in the next budget cycle if you're still here. So 
Sometime. Well, I can leave if he wants to stay. <laughs> so, so uh, sometime, you know, this this within the year he'll be he'll be retired. Yeah. That, that's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. We don't kick out politicians out. <laughs> yeah. We kick out people we need. Well, politicians don't have to carry you down the ladder if you passed out either. So, <laughs> yeah, they can um. delegate. <laughs> I trust the chief to do that more than a politician, let me tell you. <laughs> Speaking as a former politician. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, will the chairman entertain a motion to adjourn? Yes. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? We are adjourned. Record 832. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everybody.